These uh, courses obviously aim to give you an introduction on how to start your data processing and how to fit your data. And we've been lucky enough to have Bruce agree to come over and, and give us a talk through the software, which of course is uh, his development really. So um, uh, Bruce is obviously well known in the XAP community both for his scientific work and, and, and his development. So it's uh, really great to have him here today. So uh, without further ado, <laughs> thank you Bruce. All right, thanks, Paul. Hi. Who um, are, are any of you coming to XS for the very, very first time here? Is there anyone here who has not, a, a handful of people who haven't been to the Beam Line at all, but perhaps, perhaps soon? This is this is something you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. part. Okay. So, um, um, starting off with. Um, not quite, but pretty close to the introductory lecture. I'm assuming even those of you who raised your hands about not having been to a beamline yet, I, I'm assuming that you at least know a little bit about, um, about what XAPS is about. But over the course of this talk, we should go over the most fundamental points. And then after that, we'll be digging in in a lot more, a lot more detail. All right. Beautiful. OK. So um, start off with the acknowledgments. And this is more or less the acknowledgments for uh, pretty much everything I'm going to present here. So um, Matt is my, my longtime collaborator and friend and um, co-author of all of this software with me. So without, without Matt, none of, the, none of the rest of this would have happened. Um, and Shelley and Scott are two, two old friends. and. Uh, people I've been working with over the years for a long time have uh, inspired a lot of how I present the material, but have also been uh, uh, great friends in the development of the software. Um, I was fortunate, I had the great fortune of uh, getting my degree from the University of Washington in Seattle, which is the home institution of both Ed Stern and John Rare, who Ed was my thesis advisor and I worked with John also, and as well as being luminaries in the field. They're both extraordinary, extraordinary people. And if you ever have the opportunity to meet Ed or John at a conference, you'll, you'll find that out. They're, they're, they're great. So uh, you know, my, my boss is a great guy for letting me come and do things like this rather than being at home getting real work done. And, um, and of course, uh, Paul and Diamond have been very great, gracious in inviting me here and picking up the tab and, and uh, bringing us all together to do this. But I also want to thank all of you. It's it's incredibly flattering that so many of you um, so many of you want to hear what I have to say. So let's get started on that. So um, you go to the beam line, you do an XAPS experiment. You end up with data that looks something like this. And what we have plotted here is the europium L3 edge and the titanium K edge of uh, a fairly simple crystalline material, europium titanate. And you, know, you, you make a measurement, and you get a spectrum. And somehow, these data tell us something about the structure of the material. And converse, the structure of the material determines what the data is going to look like. So somehow, there's a relationship between this thing that goes up and then wiggles, goes up and then wiggles. There's some relationship between all of those wiggles and how the atoms stack together to make a material. So you go to the beam line to try and get something fundamental about your sample. You want to know the valence of the absorbing atom or um, what kind of species surround the absorber. That is, if you're doing, say, a, uh, a problem in redox chemistry or sulfidation chemistry, you want to know if your absorber is surrounded by oxygen or sulfur or metal atoms. Um, and knowing what kinds of atoms, you'd like to know how many there are. That is, you want to measure the coordination number in the coordination environment of the absorber. You might also, well, you certainly would also want to know how far apart, mater how far apart atoms are in your material. And you'd like to know something about how they're distributed. Um, how things are distributed around the absorber, what kinds of thermal and structural disorder might exist in the material. So somehow, we're going to go and measure this stuff 
and get out information about all of these things. And that, at the end of the day, is the whole point of going to the synchrotron and doing an XS experiment. So uh, what, what can you, what kinds of things could you pick up from your lab and take to the, take to the synchrotron and do an XS measurement on? Well, the answer is just about anything. And this is one of the great values of, um, one of the great values of XFs is that you really can measure just about anything. The fancy phrase that I like for this property of XFs is that in the theory and the analysis, there is no assumption of symmetry or periodicity. That means that unlike a simple diffraction experiment, you don't need something that is crystal, and that is your material doesn't have to scatter in the Bragg sense uh, to measure XFs. It can be very, very far away from being a crystal. It can be a liquid. It can have mixed phases. It can be some kind of engineered material, and on and on. Um, when I was writing up this slide, it was around the time that the chemistry Nobel Prize was awarded, so I threw quasi-crystals on the list also, which is another thing you can measure with XFs. And again, something else that doesn't require a particular assumption of symmetry and periodicity. So to make your measurement, to do the experiment that you want to do, you need to go to the right place. So, um, and you need, to, you need to prepare the sample uh, correctly so that you can measure data of the highest quality and measure the thing that you're actually setting out to measure. So there are some questions you need to think about. You need to, of course, choose the right beam line. So if you're doing a hard x-ray experiment, you need to go to a beam line that does hard x-ray spectroscopy. Um, if you're interested in doing absorption spectroscopy on something like the oxygen K edge or the carbon K edge, you, you would then need to go to the appropriate soft x-ray beam line to do that. And um, th there are some more challenging elements on the periodic table, things like magnesium and aluminum and silicon that have energies in that extremely inconvenient range between that easily done at a soft x-ray beam line and that easily done at a hard x-ray beam line. And your choices are somewhat more limited, but there are places to go do that also. So you need to do some what footwork ahead of time to make sure that the beam line you're choosing is correct. There's a whole bunch of issues about uh, sample preparation um, that you need that you need to worry about. The sample has to be prepared appropriately for the experiment. And there's, um, as I'm going to move past that in this slide, but there's ample information out there about what is meant by having the sample be, uh, be appropriate. But it's, you know, it's the other thing you have to think about. But the beauty of it is that pretty much any way that you have these things over here they can be prepped in a way that you can go to the right beam line and measure good data. It's generally not that hard to do sample prep in, in, in XFs. Um, generally, the hard part is figuring out what it all means, but actually making the measurement is relatively easy. Um, the one fascinating thing, at least for me as a beamline scientist, one fascinating thing about um, absorption spectroscopy is that it's used by literally everybody. And if you, you know, if you introduce yourselves to the people to your left and right, you'll probably find that they don't do the same kinds of science as you. For, for me, as a beamline scientist, that's great. It means that, you know, every week I have a couple of different groups coming in doing some interesting new thing that I haven't thought about. And just this fall, this is, uh, this is the variety of experiments that have been going on at my beam line. Um, to say nothing of everything else that happens at NSLS and here and all the other synchrotrons in the world. So um, widely applicable. Applicable to a wide range of materials and a wide range of scientific disciplines. And that's, that's pretty cool. So you go to the beam line. And you measure some stuff. You put your sample in. You do a good job of sample preparation. And you put your sample in the beam. And you open the shutter. And you make a measurement. And sometimes XFs is really easy. Sort of fall off a log easy. Here's an example of um, what might sound like a slightly challenging experiment uh, it, it, that we did at my beam line a, few, a, a couple years ago, although it turned out not to be. This is. Uh, uh, germanium antimony alloy, uh, relatively thin film of the stuff on silica. And because it's a thin film, we measured at glancing angle. We did a bunch of tricks to make the experiment work as well as possible. 
And what I show here is a single scan. And now this is it at my beam line, which is one of the oldest beam lines at NSLS2. Uh, we take a very small fraction of the swath of radiation that's coming out of our beam port. We have no sophisticated, um, no, oh, right, no sophisticated um, optics at the beam line. It's, it's pretty much the simplest, dumbest XAPS beam line uh, that you could imagine doing useful work at. And in one scan, 15 minutes, we had beautiful data. Okay, sometimes you go to the beam line and XAPS is hard. So here was an experiment I did some years ago at what is pretty much my favorite XAPS beam line in North America, uh, 20 BM at the APS. And for a variety of reasons, this turned into a challenging experiment. Part of it is that it was a relatively low concentration uh, experiment with a little bit of mercury bound to some engineered DNA. And we basically spent the whole day measuring scan after scan after scan after scan. And here's the whole ensemble of data. They're all pretty crappy. Here in blue is um, the chi of K, the extracted, the oscillations extracted from the data for a single scan. And you can see that the, the noise level is just enormous, right? So each individual scan was awful, but um, the central limit theorem always works, right? If you're dominated by statistical noise, all you have to do is measure longer. So we spent a whole day on it and beat the noise down to the level of the red line. Still not beautiful, but it was something that was measurable, and I ended up getting two publications out of, out of this work. So sometimes XFS is easy, sometimes it's hard. And in any case, regardless of that, there are a few things that we have to know how to do, and a few things that, and we're going to talk about all of these things um, today and in the next two days um, at some length. So you, you have to know how to evaluate the statistical quality of the data. That is, I needed to know that these were good data and have a way of saying with certainty that they're good data. And I needed to know the extent to which these are bad data. That is, I had to make a decision about how long to measure, how many scans to measure, to turn my noisy data into something that was useful. So we have to be able to evaluate the quality of our data. We have to recognize the difference between statistical and systematic error. That is, if I, I had to recognize that in those mercury data, the data I said were difficult or bad, um, that, that it was shot noise, that it was something that would go away by simply measuring for enough time. That's in contrast to some kind of nonlinearity in the beam line or a problem in the sample preparation, something that is a systematic problem that, will be, that would be in every scan that you measure. And if you have a systematic problem, well, it's not a matter of measuring more. It's a matter of fixing the beam line or fixing the sample. And the point here is that you need to be able to recognize the difference between statistical and systematic error and know what to do. In the case of the first, it's measure more. In the case of the second, it's find the problem and fix it. And you need to be able to recognize that. And here's, a, here's an interesting point that may not occur to you the first time you think through a problem. But as a consequence of being able to recognize and evaluate statistical quality, you need to know when to stop measuring a sample. That is, you need to know um, how much data is enough that you have statistical confidence in the data. But you need to also know when it's time to stop measuring that and move on to the next thing so that you get enough work done during your beam time. And that's all part of evaluating the statistical quality. And of course, you have to know how to process your data for further analysis, which is what we're going to start talking about this afternoon, and which is really, that's really the point of this, uh, this little workshop. So uh, what I showed you in the first couple of examples there were basically conventional XAPS experiments, something that probably everybody in the room will do. But probably everybody in the room will do things that are more, well, I hesitate to say interesting, but more, more involved or more elaborate than just a simple conventional XAPS experiment. Because with new technologies and spiffy, fancy new synchrotrons like here, 
like the APS or like the new synchrotron that we're building back home at Brookhaven, NSLS2, um, we get to exploit lots of interesting new technologies that let us do interesting new experiments. But as I'm going to show you, a whole bunch of interesting experiments end up being something, end up um, distilling down to something that is an XAPS spectrum. So here, for example, is um, some really beautiful work that was done a few years back at one of our microprobes at NSLS. And looking at a plant that hyperaccumulates metals from the soil, that is, if you grow this plant in a metal contaminated soil, it will more quickly than normal suck the metals out of the soil in a way that, and, and, and so it provides a way of potentially remediating metal contaminated soil. And this, this little critter um, has the additional interesting features of forming uh, these sort of star-shaped inorganic structures uh, studded all over the leaf. And so um, these folks made these beautiful pictures showing the co-location of calcium, which is calcium carbonate is what makes up the little inorganic uh, stars that stud the leaves, and various, um, various metals, uh, nickel and cobalt and zinc, um, things that might have been in the soil where this plant grew. Now, this by itself is a pretty great result and is the kind of thing that you might publish. However, at one of these microprobe beam lines, you can put the beam there or there, put the beam in a special place on the sample, and come up with XAPS spectra. And here, here the XAPS has been processed to the point of chi of k in the Fourier transform. The point being that with the x-ray being there compared to, it must be something like there, you end up with two very different species of cobalt. And so that's really powerful. You not only see elemental distribution, but you can do all of the speciation, all of the, all the, the stuff that's great about absorption spectroscopy with spatial resolution. But the point is, the point I'm making in bringing this up, is that you use this fancy technology of the microprobe, and at the end of the day, one of the things you end up with is an XF spectrum. And so again, we have to know how to process the XFs, and we have to know how to evaluate the quality of the XFs. Uh, similarly, if you're doing some kind of time resolve measurement using either a dispersive apparatus of the sort that is, uh, is being built um, over across the street at the, uh, at, at the, the XFs being line I-20. Did I get that number right? I-20. Um, or if you're using a quick scanning monochromator of the sort that they're commissioning at B18, um, you do this time resolved experiment and by plotting the data in a clever way you can see time evolution of things as they change in your sample. But again, even though it's, this is a mountain of data, they're all XS spectra. And again, to do this kind of experiment you need to know all the things on top of all the details of the more sophisticated experiment, you have to be able to evaluate the quality of the XAPs. Here's a, an experiment I did some years ago, a diffraction anomalous fine structure experiment, which is a, a, a cute trick where you coordinate the motion between um, the goniometer and the monochromator, or use some kind of fancy aerial detector to uh, um, to measure the changes in the diffraction, diffraction um, pattern as you change the incident energy. And you do this through the resonant energy of an atom in the crystal, and you end up with this interesting, these interesting spectra where the diffracted intensity changes significantly and includes oscillatory structure that shows up, I hope, much better in the handout than, uh, than uh, it's showing up on the screen. And if you process these data, uh, correctly, you end up with something that is an XF spectrum that you analyze, that you process and analyze exactly like you do with XF. So again, an elaborate experiment where you, do, you measure a lot of different things, and at the end of the day, one of the products is an XF measurement. Yet another example. Here is a, um, a, a fairly clever uh, inelastic scattering spectrometer that was developed at uh, 20ID at the APS. The basic idea is that X-rays come in, um, strike the sample, and you have a, a, a bunch of crystals 
subtending this, uh, this, this arc over the sample so that you can measure the inelastic scattering as a function of momentum transfer. A lot of details, but you measure, you measure this interesting inelastic scattering spectrum um, using these crystal analyzers and point detectors, uh, one for each of the crystal analyzers. And what you end up on each of these channels is a spectrum that looks something like this, where I've cut off the elastic peak, which is quite enormous. You see this big, um, big Compton scattering peak that disperses through the data, it turns out, as you go over the arc of the detectors and you change the, the amount of momentum transfer. But if you look at the fine details, you see at energies that correspond to binding energies for electrons in the material, you see energy loss spectra that are associated with the different, different things in the sample, um, focusing in on this little bit right here and measuring more finely, we end up with something that looks just like a Zane spectrum. So we do this, this immensely complicated experiment that involves a complicated spectrometer and measure this, this, this complicated inelastic scattering spectrum. And at the end of the day, we focus in on one part of it and interpret it exactly like a Zane spectrum. Um, so so the, the point of all of these examples, the, the thing I'm driving at is that whether you do the conventional XS experiment or you do something much more interesting that we get to do these days at the synchrotron, this basic skill of knowing how to evaluate your XS data and process it well and correctly um, is immensely useful. Hence this course. Um, okay, so uh, um, before I launch into the topic of what we do, the overview of what we do with our XS data, just want to make sure that we're all using the same vocabulary. So we, we often split up the, the XS data, the absorption spectrum, into a near edge re region and an extended region. And the jargon, some of which, well, one small part of which doesn't, I would say, doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's the jargon that we use. There's this main rising part that we call the edge, or the threshold, uh, the, the, the threshold into the unbound states that the photoelectron can be promoted into. Below the edge in some materials, particularly, uh, you'll particularly see this in transition metal oxides and other transition metal compounds, there's, a, there, there's one or more interesting, often small, but not always small, little peaks that are often referred to as the pre-edge peaks, um, which is, it, I think if you dwell too long on the word pre-edge, it, it gets a little confusing. But the sense in which it's meant is the <coughs> spectral features that show up before the main rising edge into the continuum. There's a, a, a phrase near edge that is often used to discuss these things above the main rising edge, but not all the way out into the x -apps. These are all kind of squishy terms in the sense that where I chose to draw these cutoffs is a little, a little ambiguous. Um, many of these materials, uh, uh, particularly oxide materials and, and transition metal and rare earth oxide materials will show a very tall, very sharp feature um, right at the beginning of the stand that's often referred to as the white line. And then everything that's beyond all of these other things is referred to as the extended XS. And um, here in a few minutes, I will explain to you some ways how you think about these different parts of the spectrum. So um, sort of the very most obvious way to use absorption spectroscopy is as a fingerprinting tool. That is, you have a sample and you want to know, is this an iron oxide? Is it an iron sulfide? Is it iron metal? You just you want to know the most basic thing about the material. And the reason that this works is because the details of what the data look like have to do with the coordination and valence environment of the absorbing atom. So the little quiz that I have here is I have four, um, four spectra all measured at the iron edge, but measured on 
four different things. And the question is, can you, just looking at the data, if you were to have just measured a sample that somebody handed to you but did not identify, could you identify the sample? And the answer is yes, as long as it's a pure material, because each of these things has a distinct spectrum. And I apologize for the next bit if any of you are um, like red, blue, or red, green, colorblind. The next, the transition won't make a lot of sense if any of you are colorblind, and I apologize for that. Um, it turns out that this one, the second one from the bottom, is fairy hydrite because that's what fairy hydrite looks like. The second one from the top is iron pyrite or iron sulfide, and you know that because that's what iron sulfide looks like. The top one is the metal, and the bottom one is a different oxide called hematite. And so you can use, um, you can use XS as a fingerprinting tool. <coughs> so if you have your unknown thing with an unknown iron species in it, and it could be anything. It could be your dirt, your catalyst material, your paint chip, your animal tissue, you know, whatever it is that you take to the synchrotron, if you want to simply know what is the dominant species in my sample, XS is a way to to do that kind of fingerprinting. But that's a sort of uh, qualitative kind of analysis. And there's many, many things we can do that are a lot more quantitative than that. Although fingerprinting is not to be discounted. It's, it's immensely valuable. It's, it's, it's sort of your first, uh, your first line of attack, your first wave of attack against your data is, do these look more like an oxide or do they look more like a sulfide? And that's, that's the value of fingerprinting. There's a whole bunch of things that are more quantitative that we can think about doing. So the first two, I, I use the word positioning for. And what I mean by that is that um, you, you're, you're looking at some uh, characteristic of the Zanes data and making a sort of semi-quantitative analysis based on the gross features of the Zanes data. The example on, on this side, on the... Uh, on the left as you're facing it, um, is, is approximating the amount of reduction in, uh, so, so um, what's going on in this experiment, in this paper, is that um, an oxidized form of uranium is being exposed to a kind of bacteria that is known to uh, draw energy from the uranium by, by reducing the uranium from, from U6 to U4. And, and in this way, the, the bacteria is actually drawing the energy that it needs for life from this, uh, this otherwise toxic and uh, radioactive material. And at the top, you see a standard that is pure U6. And at the bottom, you see a standard that is pure U4. And by using some feature of the, uh, feature of the zane, say, the point at which you've gone halfway up the edge, or the peak of the first derivative, or perhaps the peak of the white line, by using some feature of the Zanes, you can then quantify the amount of reduction in these various samples just by seeing where they stand between U4 and U6. And in this way, these, whatever APSA and NGA and all of those, whatever all of those mean, um, they're able to quantify the reduction of the uranium. Uh, another example of this is looking at um, sort of a cluster analysis of the pre-edge peaks in various titanium-containing minerals. And this is a, a pretty famous, pretty well-cited paper uh, that a lot of people who work in various aspects of titanium mineralogy and titanium chemistry um, uh, use. And the basic concept is by looking at the uh, heights and pos positions and energy of the pre-edge peaks in various titanium compounds, you can cluster things together. So if you go and measure something that is an unknown titanium compound, and you measure the height of the pre-edge peak and the position of the center of the, uh, the center of weight of the pre-edge peak, you can, you can, and let's say it falls somewhere in this area or somewhere in this area, then you can say, I have something that is titanium 5 plus, or I have something that is titanium 6 plus, by, by simply doing this sort of cluster analysis on, on you know, this fairly, fairly large, fairly gross feature of the titanium spectrum. However, either of these analyses um, only make sense if you really pay careful attention to the data processing. That is, you have to process and normalize your data quite well 
for either of these kinds of analyses to make sense. And so these are quantitative methods to the extent that you can do a good and defensible job in processing your data. Um, another, another thing that is often used is a peak fitting approach where you take your normalized data and build a, um, a sort of heuristic model of the data as a combination of various line shapes. And what I show here is coming up with a, a, a model for these lead titanate data. And here you see some interesting pre-edge peaks, the edge, and then the zanes has just started up here. And as a combination of an arc tangent and three um, peak functions, so Gaussians or Lorentzians, I'm able to approximate the shape of the data with these three functions. Now, the, the drawback of a peak fitting approach is that it is often ambiguous um, what physical or chemical or I suppose electronic meaning to ascribe to the various peaks. But the sense in which it's a useful quantitative tool is if you have an ensemble of data where something is changing from the beginning of the ensemble to the end of the ensemble, um, and it, you can relate the quantitative changes in these various features to whatever else is going on in the material. So if you have, say, something that is heating up and you, wanna, you, you want to uh, try and understand something about the evolution of the system, you might be able to do so quite well by doing this kind of analysis over the entire ensemble of data. Another approach, and um, a topic that I will go into in great length tomorrow, is to do uh, linear combination fitting. And the basic concept here is that if you have a sample that is a mixture of, a mixture of, of phases or a mixture of states, uh, then the data that you measure on that sample can be understood as a linear combination of the spectrum measured on the pure materials. And what's shown here, and what will be in the example I go into some length on tomorrow, is a um, system of uh, a gold chloride solution that is being reduced to metallic gold in the presence of some biomass. So there's some kind of chemical interaction between this very caustic gold 3 chloride and, um, and whatever is in the biomass. There's some kind of uh, reducing interaction so that after some great amount of time, all of the gold chloride has been reduced to metallic gold. And the concept here is that at some intermediate point, and here this is data taken seven hours into the reaction, that you can describe this as a linear combination of the spectrum of the gold chloride, the spectrum of gold metal, the beginning state and the end state, and uh, as well as some, whatever the intermediate state of the, of the system is. In this intermediate time, you can describe this as a linear combination of the two end members and it turns out one other thing. And you can do this as a function of time and come up with some kind of time dependence of the system or some quantitative measurement of the rate constant of the chemical reaction. Um, again, this is a, uh, to be a quantitative technique, this is something for which data processing is very key. That is, all of the data have to be processed. All of the data and the standards have to be processed well and normalized correctly so that you can do this kind of analysis. Another, another thing that is done with an ensemble of data like the one I just showed you is a thing that's called principal components analysis, which is, um, it's kind of a funny thing. You take the time, you take an ensemble of data. What I have here is the time series of data from the previous slide, this gold reduction process. And you perform some uh, linear algebra on the system and decompose these spectra into um, uh, the principal components, which are by themselves not, um, not physically significant, but they provide an orthogonal mathematical basis from which you can re reconstruct all of the data. Here is what the components all look like. There's one dominant component that is more or less the average behavior of the entire system. So the, the blue is basically the average of all of the data. And then the rest of the components, which are drawn here, are some kind of measure of the variations from sample to sample. And the number of statistically significant mathematical components that you 
deconvolve out of your data using this technique gives you some sense of the number of species that are present in the data. So you can, um, you can then determine what the states in the system are by trying to reconstruct standards out of these mathematical components. And so here I'm showing that there is metallic gold in the system, which we know because the system is reducing to metallic gold. We know there's metallic gold in the system because I can construct metallic gold out of this orthogonal, non-physical basis of principal components. But I'm pretty convinced that there's not gold cyanide because I cannot reconstruct the gold cyanide. So this is another useful quantitative tool to understand something about an ensemble of Zane's data. Finally, and I'm going to talk about this very, very little, um, you can do some kind of, use some kind of theory to understand your Zane's data. So you can simply do a forward simulation that has come up with some structure and have uh, a recent version of FEP calculate what the Zanes would be from your, your structural model and see how that compares to the, um, compares to the data that you measured. And by tweaking the parameters that go into the FEF calculation, you can try and better reconstruct your data. And that's a useful quantitative tool. There are a couple of tools that actually try and do some kind of numerical fitting to Zanes data. Um, this MZAN thing by um, Benfato and Della Longa is one thing that a lot of people use. Um, and this, this other program called FitIt is sort of an interesting approach to this where you try and pre-compute spectra over a multi-dimensional space and then interpolate um, from a, you do a large ensemble of, of pre-calculations and try and interpolate between those to understand what structural information you can get out of the data. Um, both of these things could merit a long talk or even a day's worth of, uh, a day's worth of instruction as can FEP. And that's sort of the end of what I'm going to say about theory other than that if, if this is an approach that appeals to you, you, there are ways to use theory also to quantitatively uh, <coughs> interpret and analyze your Zane's data. Um, so finally, getting to the XAPS analysis. So the last several slides were all about the first bit of the data. But there's a ton of information and all those wiggles that keep going on and on well past the edge. Um, so your XAPS analysis can be quite simple. And often simple is you know, sort of everything you need from an XAPS measurement. So the software tries to help you do the simple things relatively simply. And here is uh, just a quick fit to the first coordination shell of a form of iron oxyhydroxide. And uh, once, you know how to, once you know how to drive the program, importing the data and parameterizing the problem and clicking the fit button and getting to the answer, all of this can be done for a very simple problem like this in about, with about a minute's work once you know how to drive the, uh, drive the program. So it took me a minute to get this picture and get these results. And it's pretty simple. I, I just assumed that you, you have a very simple structure in the first coordination shell. It's just iron surrounded by oxygen. And by doing this simple analysis, I got almost the right answer. So I, I measured that N was 4.6. And in uh, this form of oxyhydroxide, there are five near neighbors. I got almost the right answer for the distance and uh, almost the right answer for um, the distortion parameter. The reason that I didn't quite get the right answer is because uh, lipidocrosite is actually a fairly messy structure. And there's, a, there's a, quite a large amount of structural disorder that I did not model correctly in this simple analysis. And so that accounts for the little bit of deviation and coordination number and the slightly incorrect um, value for R. Uh, but for you know, a, a short amount of work, um, this, is often, you know, this is often the level of data analysis that you need to properly, properly answer your question. Um, but the excess analysis can also be quite sophisticated, quite a bit more sophisticated than what I just did. But I don't have a slide about that because that's what we're going to be talking about for much of the rest of the course. So um, this slide is really just sort of a teaser for uh, what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And as you, uh, you know, if you dive really deeply into this whole XAPS business, your, your XAPS analysis can be really 
quite elaborate. And I'm showing you here uh, an example from uh, one of my colleagues, Scott Calvin, something he did a few years back, where he really sort of threw every trick at the book in the problem, and in doing so was able to really learn some quite extraordinary things about these nanoparticulate um, zinc manganese ferrite materials that are useful for um, uh, like um, they're the magnetic cores for power devices. Um, so he, he measured, um, measured all three edges. Now, in this structure, there's a lot of anti-site disorder. So all three metals, the manganese, the zinc, and the iron, can and do exist on either the tetragonal site or the octahedral site um, in the structure. And there's also the possibility that there will be oxygen vacancies in these materials. There's also the issue that these were nanomaterials, and so there are some, some issues that are special to the study of nanomaterials that have to be considered. And so by, by really throwing every trick at the book in the problem, and at the problem, Scott was able to create a fitting model that quantified the amount of each metal atom on each of the sites where the metal can exist, quantified the amount of oxygen vacancies in these materials he was looking at, and correctly or reasonably correctly, accounted for the, um, the effects of the fact that they were nanoparticles through every trick of the book. And what is plotted here are the data on his ensemble of different nanoparticles measured at the manganese edge, the zinc edge, the iron edge, fit all these data all in one big complicated fitting model. And the thing that might not be obvious from far away from the screen is that every single one of these is data and the fit. That is, there, there actually is a line that is the fit for every one of these data. And so by knowing sort of everything there is to know about XAPS analysis, if you're willing to put in the work, you can get remarkable things out of an ensemble of XAPS data. And this is this is a really great paper, and I highly recommend those of you who want to know really what the limits of, of XS data analysis are, I really highly recommend that you go off and look at Scott's paper. It's, it's quite a read. It's a heavy read, but it really shows you that um, big things are possible. And if you, if you put on your thinking cap and go to the XS beam line, you can go home with great stuff. So, um, so how, how, do we understand, how, how do we understand what this XS thing is? So I, I sort of threw a bunch of data at you and threw a bunch of data analysis concepts at you, many of which we're going to talk about in much more detail. But at this point, it's really important to have a good mental picture of what's really going on when you go to the beam line and measure stuff. So here's the basic picture, is that you have an atom with a deep core electron and the x-ray comes in, and if the x-ray has enough energy to overcome the binding energy of the deep core electron, then a, then a photoelectron will be ejected from the atom, leaving behind a core hole. Plotted over here is the probability of that event happening. So for an incident, an incident photon that does not have as much energy as the binding energy of this deep core state, not much happens. And then when you get to the binding energy, the probability of that photon interacting with the atom goes up dramatically, and that's the step. And then after that, it sort of tails off exponentially, sort of the way you would expect from something that behaves by, well, the Lambert-Beer law, which is basically what a transmission XS experiment is, is the, the Lambert-Beer the Lambert law in the X-ray. You sort of get an exponential after the absorption edge, you get this sort of exponential decay of the probability of the interaction. The uh, photoelectron that gets ejected has some kinetic energy that is the excess energy that the X-ray imparted above the binding energy. And because that photoelectron has some energy, it has a corresponding wavelength. So a low kinetic energy photoelectron has a long wavelength, and a high kinetic energy photoelectron has a short wavelength. Um, the bottom line, though, is that uh, it's an electron, so there has to be a state available for it. Any of these states down here below 
this threshold energy are occupied by, either don't exist or are occupied by other electrons. So there's no place for that core electron to go. So there has to be an, absorb an available state for there to be absorption. And then for this isolated atom, you get something that looks like that. And that's not very interesting. But what is interesting is when you have neighbors around. So if there's, if there's another atom sufficiently close to the absorbing atom, then you get this interesting interaction where the photoelectron can scatter off of this other atom and the outwardly propagating wave from the photoelectron can interfere with the scattered portion of the photoelectron and you get these interesting interference patterns and on top of this sort of step in exponential decay you then get all of this interesting oscillatory fine structure which is the the, 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 the business part of the, the XAPS experiment. Um, the interference between the two parts of the photoelectron wave is, of course, energy dependent because the wavelength changes with respect to the separation between the absorber and the scatterer, and that gives you some constructive interference and some destructive interference, and, and it oscillates, and that's why you get the fine structure. So, suppose we wanted to go um, suppose we wanted to uh, enlist the help of one of our theorist friends to go off and calculate a Zane spectrum for us. How might our very smart theorist friend go off and do that? Um, well, first of all, I'll just I'll say something that's uh, not a very profound statement, that XAPS, like just about everything else in physics, is, is an example of Fermi's golden rule. That is, we can understand this absorption function by somehow um, evaluating this integral, that is, evaluating what happens when something makes an electron go from its initial state I to its final state F. And the thing that makes it go that way is, of course, the incident photon, which it turns out in, in this physical mathematical description of what's going on, that the photon is a dipole operator or something that has that functional form. So to do this, so, so we need to have, whatever, whatever this math, whatever this, the, the, whatever math is involved in evaluating this uh, proportionality, we have to somehow figure out how the photo, how the, how the electron gets from its initial deep core state into its final state, which is the, the state being the, the photoelectron. There are, broadly speaking, there are two ways of solving this equation. Um, you can write down very careful mathematical expression for the initial state. That turns out to be relatively easy. Um, uh, writing down the mathematical function of the, well, by a certain definition of easy, writing down the mathematical function for the initial state is the kind of problem uh, that one learns how to do in uh, a first year graduate quantum mechanics class. So, so that's my definition of not difficult is something that can be done by a first year physics graduate student, which is still uh, sufficiently difficult and far enough away for me that I'd, I'd have some trouble doing it from scratch. And then you would also need to uh, write down the final state. And it turns out that writing down a mathematical expression for the final state is, is an extremely difficult problem. And so if you were to take this approach of writing down careful representations of the initial and final state, you do, you do all of the work coming up with the final state. But then once you have the initial and final state, the rest of it is relatively straightforward math that needs to be evaluated. The other option is to use a thing called multiple scattering theory, where instead of writing down, instead of doing the difficult work of writing down the final state, we do the difficult work of writing down something that's called a Green's function. And the way to think about the Green's function is it's the, it's the function that describes all the ways that the photoelectron can scatter off of atoms in the surrounding before something goes back to fill in the core hole that was left behind. So here's, here's how we want to think about this. In this real space multiple scattering approach, all the hard work is in coming up with this Green's function. The Green's function, and I'm just going to assert this. You can go off and read the papers. They're, some of them are, are, are quite good. Um, the Green's function is composed of two pieces that have relatively simple physical interpretations. 
And, and, and as you'll see in the next couple of slides, there's a reason why I'm going over this point in some detail. The point is not that I think it's important that you all know how to write down the math for evaluating this Green's function thing, but I think it is important to have a mental picture of what the Green's function is and what it is that's being calculated when you run the theory for, for absorption spectroscopy. So the Green's function, it turns out, can be broken down into two pieces. The piece G0 is a mathematical function that explains how a photoelectron goes from one place to another, where those two, the two endpoints of that could be, uh, say, the absorber and, and a nearby scatterer, or it could be two scatterers in the material. The point is, is that G0 is the thing that says how a photoelectron gets from one place to another. The other piece that goes into the Green's function is the so-called T matrix, which is the mathematical function that explains how a photoelectron scatters off of something. Those two pieces together are the whole story. The photoelectron propagates out and scatters off of things. And if you can write down how it propagates and how it scatters, you can, in principle, solve the whole problem. So when computational Zanes is done, when somebody says, I did a FEF9 calculation and I computed the Zanes, what that means is they wrote down, they, they wrote down in whole this G0 function, the function that describes the propagation, and they wrote down in whole the T matrix, that is, the thing that describes all possible scattering events from all possible atoms in the cluster, do a bunch of matrix algebra, which these are very large matrices, so this expression turns out to be very computationally expensive, which is why Zane's calculations have only been done routinely in the past 10 or 12 years, because this was so computationally expensive to do this for so long. And by constructing these relatively simple to calculate things and doing this big matrix algebra thing, you end up with the Green's function, the thing you're looking for, and from there it's relatively easy to finish the job and come up with a spectrum. Now, the thing that's interesting here, and again, the reason that I'm talking at all about all this complicated Green's function stuff, is that uh, you, you may recognize this expression um, is subject to a thing called a Dyson expansion. That is, this term can be written as this infinite series. And remembering the definitions of G and T, we can then come up with physical interpretations for every term in the series. That is, this thing that propagates, scatters, and propagates is the term that describes all the single scattering events. That is, all the ways that the photoelectron can leave the absorber and scatter off of one and only one neighbor. The second term, G0, T, G0, T, G0, is the term that describes all of the double scattering events. That is, all possible ways that the photoelectron can leave the absorber and scatter off of one thing, then scatter off of another thing, and then be done. And this is the triple scattering, and so on and so forth, to all orders of scattering, because the Dyson, the Dyson series is, is an infinite series. Now, what do I mean by single and double and triple scattering? Well, um, what I mean is, that is things that look kind of like this. Here's an example of a single scattering path, where in each of these, the red one is the absorber, and the yellow one is the scatterer. And a single scattering path is photoelectron goes out and scatters off of just one thing. Double scattering is scatters off of two things, and, and so on and so forth. Now, the clever thing about FEF is that FEF <coughs> further expands each of these terms so that the G0 T G0 term <laughs> is expanded into a sum of all possible paths that look like this. And then you get to calculate each of these things individually. This term is expanded into a sum of all double scattering paths. So anything that looks kind of like this, you get to evaluate individually. And so on to all orders. So here's a whole bunch of examples of what I mean in a two-dimensional crystal. 
right? So here's a, a cut through a plane of something cubic. And here's a bunch of examples of single scattering paths, where if we treat that one as the absorber, here's a really short single scattering path, here's a reasonably long one. Here's a whole bunch of examples of double scattering paths. Um, the double scattering can be all in a line, or it can make a little triangle, or it can make a fairly large triangle. Triple scattering, similarly, they can all be in a line, it can rattle around back and forth between two atoms, or it can connect four atoms that are just in some big, you know, rhomboid. Um, and FEF allows you to calculate each of these things, and all the other examples you could imagine by looking at this plot. It allows you to calculate each of them individually. So the trick to the x-axis analysis then is going to be to get a handle on this very large number of things that you might have to consider to do the x-axis analysis. So when I say that FEF calculates the scattering to all orders and furthermore breaks down each order of scattering into a potentially quite large number of examples of that order of scattering, it sounds like a very daunting problem because it sounds like you have a very large number of things that you have to worry about. But as you'll see tomorrow, it's not really that daunting that we have all of the tools that we need to dig through this huge pile of possible scattering events and focus our eye in on the things that are actually important to analyzing our data. And, and we'll, we'll learn how to do all of that tomorrow. So finally, for every one of these, uh, for every one of these things, what FEF does is it helps you evaluate the x-axis equation where for every kind of scattering path, this equation needs to be evaluated. And so there's a, a sinusoidal term. There's you know, the wiggly term, the thing that makes it wiggle. And that has something to do with um, how far apart the atoms are in a single scattering path or how long the path is in a multiple scattering path. That's what the R is. But the oscillation, oscillatory term also has something to do with what the photoelectron is scattering off of. It, the uh, amplitude of the scattering, of some scattering event, has something to do with the number of them that there are. So for a single scattering event, that would be a coordination number. But it also has something to do with what you're scattering off of. And f of k and phi of k are together the scattering function that FEF calculates and is the thing that allows us to identify um, what the species of the scatterer is when we're doing the x-axis analysis. There's a, a, a damping term that has something to do with the disorder in the system. There's a mean free path term. And um, we use FEF then to calculate the things that are in blue. And we do a fit to somehow optimize the things that are in red. And by using FEF and using the analysis software, we then evaluate the x-axis equation for every path that we want to consider in the fit. We sum them up and we compare it to the data. That's all very vague right now, but again, tomorrow, we're going to go over this in, in all kinds of detail. Alrighty, I think I'm nearly, oh, Mary joins us. Great. Um, so, um, I want to leave you with one last topic in this introductory talk, and that is to remember that you never, ever, ever do an XAPS experiment without knowing something else. You always know something about your sample going in. At the very least, you know like what the absorber is, right? But you probably also have an idea about what the coordination environment is. You probably know whether you expect it to be oxidized or metallic or sulfided or, or, or whatever. And you've probably done other measurements on your sample. You've probably done some microscopy. You might have done some elemental analysis. You might have some diffraction, so on and so forth. You have information about your sample. You never do the XFs experiment in a vacuum, except possibly at a soft x-ray beam line, right? Or, um, or in a cryostat. But I mean vacuum metaphorically, of course. You have uh, other prior 
there's a typo, you have some prior knowledge about your sample and you get to use that. So you never know nothing about your sample. You're always going to bring knowledge to your interpretation of your XS spectra. And I want, you, I want you to remember that at all times through the next couple of days. So um, that's the end of this talk and sort of setting the stage for everything else we're going to do. So um, yeah, now let's get started. You know, now, it's, now it's time to go on and learn some XS. So that's, uh, that's the intro introductory talk. Um, are there any questions at this stage? Any big overarching questions about XS?